Good afternoon. Good morning, my fellow Sevies. How are you guys doing today? We want to welcome you today, all of you who are able to join us on this beautiful day that's full of sunshine. And we want to um, and welcome all of those of you who are joining us online as well. We have quite a few announcements for you, so just bear with us. Um, first of all, thank you to all of you who participated in Sabbath to Serve last week. Um, it was a great turnout. Um, those of you who helped in the rain, that was amazing. Those of us who helped with the um, making sandwiches had kind of a cusher job, and we even got peanut or uh, we got chocolate chip cookies. So thank you, Michelle. There were sticky hands for sure, and I want to say everybody I think did a phenomenal job making sandwiches. For the record, there is a correct way to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, okay? And that correct way is you spread lightly, light amounts of peanut butter on both sides of the bread, and the jelly goes in the middle. This prevents the jelly from soaking into the bread and getting your sandwich moist. <laughs> the more you know. Is this me? Yeah. Okay, so yes, all right. Guys, so tonight we have worship. It is going to be at 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. It will be led out by our EAA praise band with special guests. Yes, this is not something you're gonna wanna miss. Be sure to come. There will be cake and pie, so make sure you come with an appetite. There's actually not, I, I was told that if you tell people there's gonna be cake and pie, they're more likely to come. There's, there's actually not gonna be cake and pie. But you should still come, okay? And bring cake or pie. All right, um, VBS registration is open, so um, you can click on the link on our bulletin and um, register. It's going to be from June 10 to 14, so make sure, kiddos, that you guys are signed up for that. Also, on April 14, um, the Women's Club of Vista is hosting a, a fun walk for autism, and they are in need of volunteers. So if you are a high school student who's looking for a community service hours, or if just autism is something that speaks to your heart, please volunteer for that. And then um, we also have this tomorrow at 9 a.m., WOW Women's Ministries is having their um, monthly breakfast at J&M's restaurant here in Escondido. So you are, all women are welcome to join that. And lastly, we've got an announcement regarding our Grape Day Park event on April 20th. I believe that there is a video clip that we should watch for this. I think there Hello, is. We there Ruben, is. Alexis, and Megan. And we are so delighted to be with you guys in Escondido. April 20th. Praise the Lord. That was nice. Yes, so love like Jesus, April 20th at Grave Day Park. Please do note that we are not going to have Sabbath school or church open in this building on that day. The full service will be at Grave Day Park, and it's going to start at 11 a.m. There will be bounce houses um, for, I think, for adults and kids. At least for kids there will be. Uh, and there's also going to be food trucks, and I'm Food trucks are going to be good. Come to the, we'll just say the food trucks are going to be great. So please do come for that, guys. Any questions? All right. So we're going to invite the kids to come up. Miss Linda is going to do our children's story. So children, please come up for the story. All right, everybody, come on up. Come on up. Okay, everybody can, I need everyone, do you see that camera over there? That camera has to see all of this. So I need everybody down, 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 okay? And actually, if you sit back, you can see it. I can bring it up front and you guys can watch it, okay? So, I have to tell you something. 
Do you know what happened after Jesus died? Who knows what happened after Jesus died and he was in the tomb? What happened to Jesus? Does anyone know what happened to Jesus? Who knows? No one? Uh, Kayla, tell us. He rose from the dead. Right. He rose from the dead. But he stayed. He stayed with the disciples in Jerusalem for over a month. He was with them. And they were so happy that Jesus was there. He started teaching them different things. But then Jesus said, I have to go up into heaven to be with my father. But I'm going to send someone else down. I'm going to send the comforter who is the Holy Spirit. Now, do you think the disciples were happy or sad that Jesus left? Sad. They were sad that Jesus had left. But they had to have something special. They had to have something called faith. And faith is believing in something even though you can't see it, right? So I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer. I need, oh, I, I cannot ignore Vera. Vera, come over here. You're going to be my volunteer today. Okay, so right here I have a container with water. And I have a stirring stick, right? I have a glass stirring stick. Vera, I would like you to put the stick in the water. Good job. Okay. Now, can everybody see the stick? You guys can see the stick, right? Even though it's in water, you can still see the stick that's all the way down here, right? Yeah? Okay. So, pretty easy, right? Yes. Yeah. So now, Vera... I want you to take this stick and I want you to put it in this container, okay? This container does not have water. This container has oil. Yeah, it has oil. Stick it in all the way. Can you guys see the stick? Can you see it? No. No. It disappeared. It disappeared in the oil. Wait a minute. But is the stick still there? How do you know that? It's not, I can't see it. Can you see it? No. But you know that the stick is still there. That's kind of like what faith is. We know as Christians that Jesus is still with us even though we can't see him. And you know what, Vera? I'm going to ask you to do the last one. So I have on the top is oil and on the bottom is water. Okay, Vera, what do you think is going to happen? I think it's going to... Is it going to disappear? No. It's not going to disappear. That's what Vera says. Go ahead. Put it in. Whoa. What happened to the stick? It disappeared right there, but it didn't disappear right there. That's right. It, it half disappeared. So we can still see the stick on the bottom, but we can't see it when it's in the oil. But hey, is the stick still there? Yes. yes, for sure. It's still there. And I know that the stick is still there. And that's what faith is. The disciples had to get used to living in faith and knowing that Jesus was with them because he said, I will be with you till the end of time. And that's how we live today. Has anyone here seen Jesus? No, no. I haven't seen Jesus. Has anyone seen Jesus? But do we know that Jesus exists? Yeah. Yeah, we know that Jesus exists. And you know what? Jesus had a special blessing for all of us here today. Because he said, he said to someone who didn't believe in him, who was Thomas, he said, you believe because you have seen me. But blessed are those who who believe without seeing me. We have a blessing today because we believe that Jesus exists even though we don't see him with our eyes. So I want you to go. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of knowing who you are. And thank you for the faith 
that we believe that you exist even though we don't see you. Thank you, Father, because it's not easy at times to live by faith. But we know that living by faith is the only way to live, to trust you and to know that you're always with us, even in the hard times. Bless these children and bless their homes. In your name we pray. Amen. You may now go get your lamb's offering. And I will ask the deacons to come forward and collect the tithes and offerings. church we're so excited to be here to worship i'm gonna invite you guys to stand as we sing our first song after that you guys can do whatever you guys want sit down stand let's worship here we go the weapon the weapon may be formed but it won't prosper when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve, because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. My God. My God will never fail. I'm going to see. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh. Here we go. There's power. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. 
Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how the story ends. I know. Yes, I know how the story ends. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Come on, declare. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Come on, declare church. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Come on, you take. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You, go, I, you take. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. What the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Come on, church. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. so hard to see it took me so long to believe it you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection perfection could never give what we don't deserve and you take the broken conquer 
to invite anyone forward who would like to join me up front here for prayer now and for the rest of you to adopt a posture that is comfortable to, for you.
think of those who are sick. We think of um, Francisco and his recent diagnosis. Please be with him, be with his medical team, be with his family, and call a special blessing on him and everyone here, Lord, whether we're sick, whether we're sick mentally, physically, spiritually, be with us, bring us, bring us healing. We know you're capable of doing that. And Lord, we just think of our future plans. Some of us have big changes in the future. Your help. So just be with us. Thank you for being with all of us in the future. And Lord, just be with Janelle as she speaks through you. She's going to be a wonderful um, voice for your message. And we love you so much. Pastor Lafitte has this moment of what's been going on in the church and that kind of stuff, right? We see in these slides. And um, last week, he wanted me to, to let you guys know um, on his behalf um, that he's just so thankful for what took place in this church and the service that we did in serving our community. And so for all the leaders who were a part of that, for everybody who took the responsibility to lead teams, we just want to thank you. I don't want to forget names. I know we have Michelle, we have Jeff, Jerry was a part of that, Barry. Um, I know there were others, and, I, and I'm sorry if I'm forgetting a name or two or three or four. Um, but we just want to say thank you and for the church community for also just um, being there to, to serve. Next, you're going to hear from one of our elders, Janelle. And Janelle is been a part of this church community for a while and we're just, I don't know what I, oh there you go we're just so excited to have you here Janelle and for speaking so for those of you who are visiting us Janelle is one of our elders and it's been one of our elders for a long time and so we're just blessed to have her speak to us I'm going to welcome you up Janelle and I, I know that Estes is coming as well Everybody, happy Sabbath. Today we'll be today we'll be reading scripture from Acts chapter one, verses four through eight. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command: Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. introduce you to Estes Taylor. Estes is one of our middle schoolers, and I gotta tell you, if you have any doubts about, let me get this away from my cheek, if you have any doubts about the future of our church, just come hang out in middle school, because we have the most amazing kids in our middle school. So thank you, Estes, for representing them today. I'm so proud of you. Good morning, church. This is really going to drive me crazy. Maybe I really will do a... Hold on, David. Okay.
We'll do this the old fashioned way. Thanks. This may be the one and only time you see a pastor undressing someone in church. <laughs> All right. So, who are we at the Escondido Seventh day Adventist Church? We are people who love God and love people, right? We are God's representatives. And we have some people visiting today. I know two of them. I met them. Estes' grandparents are here with us today. So welcome. I'm so glad you were here. I'm sure we have others. So if you want to know who we are, this is who we are. We live by this not only today, but every day. We try to live in a way that shows that we love God and we love people. So I um, saw something in the sky, and you guys, if you can put it on the back, then I don't have to turn around too. That'd be great. I saw something in the sky this last week. I don't know if you saw it or not. Did you see the question mark in the sky? Right at the bottom. Joe and I walked outside, and here was this beautiful question mark in the sky. And I went, boy, is that a good example of how I feel sometimes. Talking to God, God not talking back, God sometimes talking back. Eh, big question mark in the sky. And I know someone else who had that same question mark in the sky. His name was Theophilus. We meet him in the beginning of Luke and the beginning of Acts. Now, who was Theophilus? His name means loved by God or friend of God. We don't know a lot about him except that he lived when Luke wrote his books. He was alive. That was 61 to 63 AD. Think of when Jesus was crucified. That's only 30 years later. You've got first person accounts in both Luke and Acts. And they're first-person accounts by someone who is educated. The, Luke was probably chosen by Theophilus to go check things out. And Theophilus didn't just pick one of the crowd. He picked an educated man who could not be duped. So if you want to really put that question mark in the sky, go, are you real? God gives you reasons to believe. Can we go to the next slide? He was likely a person of high social standing because Luke called him most excellent, and that is a title of respect or authority in the Roman world. And he wanted to know the truth about Jesus' death and resurrection. He wasn't interested in following the crowd. He wanted to know for himself. Some of us are wired to ask questions. Anybody identify with that? I certainly do. I'm wired to ask questions. I don't want to just follow the crowd. I want to know for myself. Apparently, God doesn't have a problem with that. He put two books in the Bible saying, I researched it. Here's the facts. So, we always start our sermons with a question so that you can greet each other. I love that Pastor Lafitte does that, and I'm going to do it too. Here's the question. Do you know someone in your family or close friends who needs proof? Do you know where to find that proof? So I'm going to give you about three or four minutes, maybe up to five, because I like greeting time, to stand up, greet the people around you, and ask that question. Do you know someone who needs proof? to believe, and do you know where to find that proof? So go ahead and visit a bit.
It's a wonderful thing to hear you all visiting and talking. Such a beautiful sound. So I have found through my life that I really have been drawn to authors who are logical. Many people, me included, find our faith is strengthened by studying Christian apologetics. We have a slide to go with this. Christian apologetics has nothing to do with apologizing. It is a intellectual defense of the truth of Christianity. And I put some of the things that have had great meaning to me. The book Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis is one of the most logical things I've ever read. If we are nothing but crawling out of muck, then why have morals and values? Where did those come from? Where did conscience come from? Where did it? I love the way C.S. Lewis writes. Then there is Hugh Ross. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I didn't make it through Creator in the Cosmos. It is physics on a university level. Joe did, however. And what I gleaned from that is that as an astrophysicist, Hugh Ross has logical reasons, um, mathematical reasons, why the universe could not be by chance. Then there's person of interest. I just discovered this, I think it was written about a year ago, a year or two ago. This is a cold case detective who said, if I didn't have a body and I had basically a crime scene, how could I put together what really happened? And he convinced himself by using cold case methods that Jesus did live, did die, and was resurrected. And then there's seeking all of finding Jesus. Looking for something besides Jesus and over and over and over being directed to the reality of who Jesus is. These are books that I think you might really enjoy if you're like me and need proof. Then there's also a website, Women in Apologetics, which I just had to throw in that there are women doing this too. I also want to acknowledge that many of the concepts that I'm going to be speaking about today came from years and years of reading Philip Yancey and of listening just recently in the last year and a half to John Mark Comer. These, again, are people who don't want you to believe just because the crowd believes. They give you reasons to believe. So let's start with prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. To really understand the book of Acts, you have to go all the way back to Genesis and Exodus. God chose a people, but he started with Abraham. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had Joseph. That family line, and then 400 years of slavery. During that 400 years of slavery, God raised up a people. Now, you ask me, I wouldn't have chosen slavery as a way to, as a way to raise up a people, but that's how God did. They multiplied, and now they are being delivered. Delivered from slavery, and there's a million or more of them. How is God going to relate to people who have never related to anything but slavery? Well, God related to them in the way a parent would relate to a toddler. You do this, this will happen. You go outside the boundaries here, you'll be punished. You do something really egregious, the punishment will be very serious. God related to them just like a parent relates to a toddler. He was teaching them, teaching them in a very simple way. He gave them rules, and they learned God makes the rules, the leaders explain the rules, the rest of us keep the rules and hope God is happy. Until Jesus. 
Jesus came and said, I want an interactive relationship with my people. I want humans to know what God is really like, not just rules, but emotion, participation, interaction. Jesus was present and he interacted directly with humans. He said, I want you to grow into thinking adults, much like a parent would a child that's about to launch. Look, I won't always be with you. I can't go to college with you. But let me review with you. You really don't want to drive like a maniac up the hill to PUC, especially when it's foggy. Use common sense. Think. Think. I'll tell you, I've been teaching you, but someday I'm not going to be here. I need you to launch. Now in Acts, Jesus leaves. Can we fast forward to the correct pictures, please? Now we're in Acts. Jesus leaves. His parting words to them are, wait for the Holy Spirit. Don't try to do this life on your own because you can't. This is their introduction to the third member of the Trinity. Humans will now have a relationship with all three. For the first time, we're introduced to the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 is about graduation day. The disciples and all future followers of Jesus are expected to graduate. We've been taught the faith of religion as children. Jesus comes into our life and he solves our problems. Now we need to have a faith that is forced to go from guided by our hand in person to belief in what is unseen. This is Acts. John Mark Comer talks about three levels of faith. Faith starts as a relationship which is based on quid pro quo. If James was here, he could explain in detail what quid pro quo means, but it easily it means, I do this, you do that. I do this, God does that. It's the vending machine approach. If I put in my prayer, I get out my answer. And for many of us, it is the way we were first taught. It's the children of Israel in the Old Testament. Then there's the faith of desperation. It's characterized by a profound dependence on God in times of crisis or times of need. These are the disciples and Jesus in the four Gospels. But finally, there is that top level of faith, that faith that we are all striving for, the faith of surrender, where we do not seek a particular outcome, but we trust that God will work through all things. Our trust in God remains strong, independent of the outcome. This is the apostles and the early church of Acts. In my experience, there is a huge learning curve, and I mean age 10 to 90, between faith of desperation and faith of surrender. I am still trying to learn this. I think there's probably an intermediate step, I would try, call it trying to surrender, where you put your toes in surrender and then you yank them out because it is terribly uncomfortable. We humans are not, not really able to make that jump very well. So now in Acts 1, we see Jesus ascend to heaven, the disciples are left on earth. Will they revert? to the faith of quid pro quo, because that's their culture. Will they remain stuck in the faith of the crowds who need to see miracles to believe? Or will they graduate to a faith of surrender that they saw Jesus pattern in Gethsemane and on the cross? The entire book of Acts is the answer to that question. I'll give you a hint. The disciples go from being disciples to being apostles. Apostle means a messenger or one sent. When was the last time you saw an emissary of a king or a country being sent who doesn't represent very well? The apostles learned. They stepped up to the faith of surrender. 
So how can we do that? How can we learn from their experiences? Let's start by looking closely at verses 4 through 8 that Estes read for us. In red, hopefully you can see that in red, what's the first command Jesus said? Wait. Are we very good at it? But I've heard, I've heard message after message about don't run ahead of God. I've learned in my life that when I have to put all of my weight against a door and shove over and over and over, I'm probably running ahead of God. Took me a long time to learn that, but I figured it out. Then the second thing it, they say is, you don't understand the whole picture. You never can understand the whole picture. God will provide what you need even if you don't know the outcome or the timing. Jesus is basically saying, you don't know what's coming, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story. Grow in your faith. But does this mean I'm going to get the outcome I want if I wait and believe and trust? Do I have to grit my teeth and try harder, pray harder, start, start my Instagram prayer chain so I get what I want? Do I have to do more? What if I don't like where the Holy Spirit is leading me? Those are fair questions. I think we can get stuck on those questions. I fear that we as Christians in 2024 have trouble with a difficult or undesirable outcome because we're taught from a very early age to pray for what we want. And then we are taught to claim verses in the Bible to support praying for what we want. I think it sets us up a little bit. This motivation can be very good. It can remind us to stay connected to God in all things. It can help us reach goals and work harder to get better at mu musical instruments or grades to graduate from high school and college. It can provide our motivation to get the job we should have. It can encourage us to sacrifice in raising our families. It can even encourage us to prepare for retirement. The disciples were not wrong to wish for Jesus to reestablish his kingdom. They believed the Torah's predictions and the direct connection they had been taught from the appearance of the Messiah to the rise of Israel. But they didn't have the full picture just like we don't have the full picture. They didn't have any idea how long God was going to take to accomplish that and how God rarely does things in the way we expect. Notice that? Has that been real for you? Because boy, has that been real for me. Acts is full of difficult outcomes. It's a book that consistently reminds us that we do not see the bigger picture, just as the disciples did not see the bigger picture. And we don't know, our we don't know God's timing any more than the disciples did. The Holy Spirit, beyond that, will often lead us into things that are much more difficult than we expect. Let that sink in for a minute. The Holy Spirit will often lead us into things that are much more difficult than we expect. A lot of us have subtly been taught that God, when God is leading, things will go more smoothly, will be healthier, the outcomes will be nicer. But Acts turns this Adventist version of the prosperity gospel on its head. Acts clearly shows that being a follower of Jesus is not a way to avoid difficulty or get the life that we want. Life with Jesus is a journey of faith that requires us to accept that no matter what happens, whether we understand it or not, whether we like it or not, God is with us and we are loved. It requires that we accept that the Holy Spirit may lead us into difficulty rather than helping us avoid it. Are your teeth on edge yet? They're a little on edge for me preaching this. But it's true. That's what Acts says. The reality of being an all-in follower of Jesus means wait. You won't know how long. You will not understand the whole picture, and probably it will be very little like what you expect. But God will provide for you and love you through all of the ups and downs. Following by faith will rarely go the way you expect, 
You may even feel very alone at times. And this is, this is a struggle for many of us. The slide from Wesley Allen, the professor at SMU, is the one we like now. We're past that. There we go. Wesley Allen Jr. says, although the story of Pentecost with the gift of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church gives an answer to the question of Christ's absence, it is a partial answer only. The Christ who was physically raised from the dead is no longer physically present with his followers. All Christians struggle with the, uh, with the experience, sorry, all Christians struggle with the experience of divine presence and absence between divine revelation on one hand and divine silence on the other. The experience and theology of God as present and absent is a paradox that must be kept in tension. Think of the story of Joseph in Genesis. As a teen, Joseph has a dream of what the future will look like what his future will look like. He will have authority. He will have power. In fact, he had two dreams. It wasn't just a little maybe. It was absolutely, you will be powerful and your family will bow down to you. 22 years later, 22 years later, after two dreams, where he did not see slavery, he did not see false accusation, he did not see being forgotten in jail, he did not see being alone. Remember, he came from a big family. He didn't see any of that. He only saw the outcome. Well, during those 22 years, he had no Bible. The Bible didn't exist then. He had no believers around him. He had only God and him, and he clung to God because there was literally nothing else to hold on to. 22 years later, he rises to power. The disciples also had their own journeys of highs and lows, times of community, times of being alone, waiting for the fulfillment of their dream. Christian tradition says that the disciples traveled, suffered, and died as martyrs. Think of how far these guys traveled how much they believed in what they were saying. They went as far as modern-day Russia and Spain. That's over 3,600 miles from here, from San Diego, to the North Pole. They went to India and Ethiopia. That's 2,600 miles, San Diego to Miami. They had a story to tell. And every one of them but John died a martyr's death for their faith, as did many in the early church. They graduated to a faith that didn't know what was coming, didn't know how their life would play out or when it would end, but they chose to trust God through it all. Acts is not about giving you a life of ease and comfort. Think about it, though. Because of what those disciples did and how far they traveled and the story they told, we're sitting here today. Without what they went through, we would not be here. So how do we as a church and each of us as individuals grow from that quid pro quo faith into and through the faith of desperation to settle firmly in the faith of surrender? Instead of gritting our teeth, trying to avoid difficulty, what if we looked at, the way, at difficulty the way the apostles did? And I'll be honest with you. I'm not at all sure this level of faith is humanly possible. John Mark Comer suggests that this level of faith requires a combination of a willing heart and a gift from God. What we do is to stay connected in all circumstances and to have that willing heart. What God does is give us a level of faith that is beyond human ability. A gift of faith from God to a willing person. I believe it also requires a complete reframe of how we view difficulty and how we respond to it. The apostles did not view difficulty as something to avoid. They viewed it as something the Holy Spirit might lead them into, and they responded with different things. Sometimes they sang. 
Sometimes they talked. Sometimes they just waited. I've been reading a book, Facing the Mountain. Um, if some of you have read Boys in the Boat, this is the same author. And this book is about the forgotten heroes of World War II, the Japanese 442nd Division, Japanese-American 442nd Division. While many of their families were in internment camps, and if you have driven by Manzanar and some of these others, they're miserable places. While many of their families were in internment camps, these young men of the 442nd were doing amazing things for the United States that they loved. When the Japanese people were sent to internment camps in World War II, they lost everything. They were allowed to take one suitcase with them. These were people who had businesses, who owned land, who had, who had settled, but they were put in internment camps and told you can take one suitcase with you. They did something that I found amazing. They dressed in their very best clothes to go to an internment camp because they said that is our way of showing that we respect ourselves. I thought that was pretty profound. Within a year, they were there, many of, many of the families were there a year, and they were often broken up, by the way. Men would go one place, the children and women would go another. Within a year, most of these camps had a school for the children. They had beautiful art made out of polished stones. They had leadership teams basically governing the camp. They had furniture made out of scrap wood. And they put on plays and musical programs. They reframed difficulty. I'm not suggesting we should seek out difficulty, and I'm definitely not saying we should enjoy it. I don't think any of the disciples enjoyed their time in prison, their floggings. I don't think any of them would have chosen a martyr's death. But we are sitting in this church today because of all they went through. Acts is a counter-narrative to the marketing campaigns of Western culture. We do not deserve happiness, ease, or comfort. It is God's rebuttal to the idea that upward mobility is our right. Acts tells us right up front that Jesus will not fit into today's advertisements. I love this when I found it because it's so true about anything, whether it's school, whether it's friends. Uh, can we go back to the last slide, please? Yeah, thanks. Whether it's school, whether it's friends, any of that, it's so circuitous how you get there. What if we reject the concept that we deserve? What if instead we reframe against culture's model and say, let's focus on our relationship with Jesus so strongly that no matter what happens, easy or difficult, we know for certain it's part of a big picture. This requires us waiting. I long for that level of faith. Do I have it yet? Not really. To take away the idea that I deserve to look good, that I deserve to walk in high heels. Many of you know I wasn't walking in high heels for two years, and now I'm back in them. It's so easy for us to think about what we deserve. In the midst of our family struggle with depression and health issues, the unpredictable things that are out of our control with our company, in 30 years of being an executive, I have never encountered some of the crazy, nuts things that have happened to our company. During all that, I wondered, what is God doing? I didn't doubt God's love for me, and I didn't doubt my salvation or Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, but I wondered, what is going on? And does it have to be this difficult? I've actually looked up in the sky and gone, does it have to be this hard? And I will surely never know the answer to that question. I wonder what the purpose is for all the suffering I see around me, the number of widows in this church the number of people who are dealing with cancers and other serious illnesses. 
What is the purpose of that? I don't know. God did not answer those questions. God just says, trust me. I sent the Holy Spirit to be with you through all things. The book of Acts is our university-level course in the fact that the Holy Spirit is not going to conform to my wants. The Holy Spirit may lead me into difficulty, may lead you into difficulty, and we will simply not understand why. Acts invites us to grow up, graduate to a new level of faith, trust even when the outcome and the timing aren't clear, there is a bigger picture even though you can't see it. So I want to challenge us as individuals, as parents and grandparents, to be real and honest with ourselves and our kids. Life on this planet looks like that a lot. We're in a war zone between good and evil. Pain and difficulty are guaranteed. But Acts shows us that in some of those really nasty little places where you're going to fall on the rocks, there's a path up and out. Who do you think built that bridge across the next one? Who do you think provided the boat to get across the next one? You're not alone. It may not be what you want or expect, but you are not alone. Acts shows us that God can use both joy and pain, easy time or difficult time for his purposes. I do not fully understand how people develop that deepest level of faith of surrender. I don't know how people develop surrender when they're facing death. Death of a dream, death of a relationship, death of functionality, death of someone they love, or even their own death in a really miserable way. But I know that kind of faith exists, and I long for it. I have to say that one of the amazing things to me about Ed and about Mark was during difficult times, you could always count on them being here at church and Aaron and John and many others. They were here at church loving up on us no matter what was going on in their life. The apostles and the believers of the early church, those who followed the way, really lived by these verses. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. In the next week, as we study the entire book of Acts, the next weeks, probably months, I'm hoping, Acts is a great book, we'll begin to understand that God plays the long game when it comes to timing. We live in minutes, hours, days, months. God lives in the long game. He certainly did with apostles. We will see how the apostles in the early church reframed difficulty. They didn't do everything in their power to avoid it. They trusted God through it. And we will see the ways that they responded in tough times. Acts is a college-level course on how to practically live this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. So let's get ready, church, to learn together and graduate to a new level of faith. Thank you. Let's... I just want to say to those of you who prayed for me, I felt the Holy Spirit through every portion of preparing this, and I am glad that it touched your heart because the Holy Spirit prepared you to hear this. Let's close with prayer. And as soon as we're done with prayer, I just want to remind you, don't forget to be Jesus' hands and feet to those who need food. We have the, the bags outside. Father God, we would love to be led through the good times and avoid the bad times. But for whatever reason, you've chosen not to do that with your followers. You have chosen to let us go through times where we have to be completely, fully dependent on you. You've chosen to put us through times where you are silent and we wonder where you are. You have chosen to make us grow in faith. And 
we ask, Lord, we will provide the willing heart. Please provide a faith that no human can find. We're not capable. We need you. We thank you and praise you that if we have the desire to grow in our faith, you will reward us by giving us a greater level of faith. I am so grateful to pray that prayer, Lord, and I thank you for what you are doing here today and in the future of this church. Thank you for giving us young people. I'm not sure I love that term. Let me just say our middle schoolers and our high schoolers who are well on their way to being adults, independent adults. Thank you for giving us kids who love to think, who love to ask hard questions, who love to know more. Thank you, God. What a gift to this church. We love you. We praise you and worship you. We thank you that you hear us, love us, and have saved us. Amen.